Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Schultz. I am the Water Education Specialist with the California Department of Water Resources, and I'd like to welcome you to Water Wednesdays. For the past four weeks, we have been talking about salmon, their life cycle, and some of the research and restoration work that DWR does to help ensure healthy salmon populations. We started the series with adult salmon spawning in the gravel beds of the Feather River, basically in downtown Oroville. We then followed the juvenile salmon through their alvin and fry stages down the Feather River, into the Sacramento River, onto the Yolo Bypass for those lucky enough to spend some time on the floodplains, and then into the Delta. If you missed any of these, you can find them on our YouTube channel. The easiest way to do that is just go to YouTube and search for California DWR. Today, we are continuing our German with journey with the salmon out to the sea. And to help us with this, we have a special guest, Brittany Strzok from NOAA Fisheries. The mission of the California Department of Water Resources is to sustainably manage the water resources of California in cooperation with other agencies to benefit the state's people and protect, restore, and enhance the natural and human environments. This means that our work essentially ends at the coastline, but salmon, like so much of life on Earth, don't really recognize the boundaries between different government agencies. In fact, much of their lives are spent at sea, and so what happens there is really important for their success in returning to the rivers of California to spawn and continue the next generation. That's where NOAA Fisheries comes in. NOAA Fisheries is responsible for the stewardship of the nation's ocean resources and their habitat. They provide vital services for the nation, productive and sustainable fisheries, safe sources of seafood, the recovery and conservation of protected resources and healthy ecosystems, all backed by sound science and an ecosystem-based approach to management. And Brittany is here to tell us today about some of what they are learning about the salmon's life at sea and how they work to fulfill their mission. So before I turn things over to Brittany, I just wanna go through a few logistics. If you are joining us on Zoom, uh, we have asked you to turn your cameras and your audio off. This just helps us have a, a smoother presentation without interruptions with the dogs barking or the leaf blowers. Um, but we really do want to hear from you. And so at the bottom of your screen is a chat box. It says chat and it has a little speech bubble next to it. So please feel free to send any questions you have to Brittany, either during the presentation or afterwards. If you are joining us on YouTube, but you have some questions and you'd like to ask, I believe you can still go to the Zoom link and join us that way as well. Um, otherwise, you're, you're still gonna get the same presentation. I just won't be able to ask the questions. There is a closed caption feature on Zoom. If you want to have it on you, and you don't see it right now, you just click on the button and it'll turn on. If it's on and you don't want it on, click on the same CC button and it's also down at the bottom of the Zoom screen and it'll turn it off. That takes care, I think, of, of how to use Zoom. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Brittany. Hey, Brittany. Hello, I'm going to share my screen. Good afternoon. I'm excited to be with you on Water Wednesday. My name is Brittany Strzok and I am a fish biologist with the federal government. My agency name is a mouthful, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. For short, we say NOAA or NOAA. NOAA is a big agency, so the smaller group I belong to is called the National Marine Fisheries Service, or for short, NOAA Fisheries. Today, I hope to close the loop on the salmon life cycle by focusing on the portion of salmon life that occurs in the ocean, or the big blue, as some of us call it. The ocean portion of the life cycle is still somewhat of a mystery for scientists, but I will share with you what we know so far about what happens to salmon and where they go once they enter the ocean. But first, I wanna quickly review a few unique facts about salmon. 
They migrate from freshwater to saltwater, and that's why we call them anadromous fish. They return to their hometown rivers where they were born. They have a strong sense of smell. Sadly, they die after they lay their eggs, but they change color as they move through their life cycle. Salmon can be three different colors over the course of their life. For example, young sockeye are light colored and spotted, and during their adult years in the ocean, they're silvery blue. When it's time to lay their eggs, their adult bodies turn a brilliant red color and their heads turn green. I know you've been learning about Chinook salmon through this series, but there are other salmon species along the West Coast. Let's quickly review all five species. Chinook is usually the biggest out of all of these, followed by chum, coho, sockeye, then pink. Let's take a moment to talk about the smallest of these salmon, the pink salmon. Pink salmon have lower oil content in their bodies, so fishing companies like to can the fish meat. Have you seen canned salmon in your grocery store? Or they fillet and flash freeze the meat, um, which is made into nuggets and prepared into complete prepackaged meals sold all over the world. So although they're small in size, they make a global impact. From seals to killer whales, at least 137 different species depend on salmon. Salmon are important for the Native American tribes. For thousands of years, salmon have been the primary food source for the Northwest Coast Native Americans. Salmon are relied on for food, jobs, and a big part of West Coast seafood culture. Salmon affect the economy of coastal communities. Salmon keep their ecosystems in balance. A slight change in salmon populations can lead to a big change for the whole ecosystem. Let's focus on one specific environment salmon have to move through before they enter the ocean. This brings us to one of my favorite areas, the estuary, where the river meets the ocean. So far through this series, you've learned the amazing downstream journey young salmon take to get to this point in their life. Estuaries link fresh and marine environments. Estuaries are where young salmon can grow rapidly and get familiar with saltwater environments. These spaces are generally safe for young salmon with opportunities to eat and hide from bigger fish. You will notice the young coho in the picture is the biggest. This sometimes happens in estuaries because coho may decide to stay longer, eating and growing bigger in the estuary, relative to how long a Chinook salmon may stay in the estuary. A salmon's first year at sea is the most critical for its survival to adulthood. Timing of when they enter the ocean and their body size are two major factors scientists consider when studying if young salmon will survive past their first year at sea. If you're a young salmon, then the bigger you are, the better. So how do scientists study salmon after they leave the estuary? We track young salmon movements using sound emitting tags that are detected by our sound receivers. The data helps us identify species specific differences in migration depth and other movement patterns. We document changes in salmon survival and body size to establish long-term patterns of marine survival. There's a second kind of tag. A satellite tag is attached to a larger salmon where it collects data on temperature, depth, and light intensity. When scientists are finished tracking the fish, the tag releases from the fish, pops up to the surface of the ocean, and transmits its stored data to satellites researchers can access from a computer. One study in Alaska tagged adult Chinook salmon. Sadly, over half of the tag fish were consumed by marine predators, including sharks, other fish, and marine mammals. So this is one reason why we have limited information on salmon in the ocean. Acoustic tags are typically implanted inside the salmon's body. Each tag transmits a unique sound that identifies the individual when it's within range of a receiving instrument that listens for the sound signals. Scientists want to measure how salmon move through their environment and they want to observe how salmon use their environment to grow. 
One local Central Valley study found that tagged Chinook salmon were relatively restricted to either two places, either just south of San Francisco Bay or just to the north of San Francisco Bay. Another study north of California showed that young salmon scatter in all directions as they first enter the ocean, which is contrary to previous thinking that most salmon head north immediately after leaving the Columbia River. This river forms the border between Oregon and Washington state. There's another method to study salmon at sea without using tags. Let's focus along the Oregon and Washington state coastline. We conduct the juvenile salmon sampling program. Juvenile simply means young salmon. For 22 years and counting, we collect salmon in May, June, and September along 50 stations in the ocean. Ocean, ocean water samples are also collected at each station so we can better understand sea surface temperature and salinity, depth profiles of salinity and temperature, and water transparency, which tells us how far down the light reaches within the water column. So how do scientists collect young salmon? We use a surface trawl net to conduct surveys each night. We try to do three surveys per night. We're searching for salmon when they come up to the surface to feed at night, so it makes sense for us to use a trawl near the ocean surface. For each trawl sample, all fish are identified and counted and the links are measured, then they're individually frozen. Number of young salmon caught during June and September trawl surveys help us understand ocean survival for Chinook and coho salmon. Ocean survival is closely related to changes in ocean conditions, like the surface winds and temperature of the ocean. Let's take a deeper dive under the sea. One major influence on the ocean is the state of the El Nino Southern Oscillation. For sure, we say El Nino. El Nino exposes some of Earth's existing heat so that the ocean becomes really warm with less ingredients to support the ocean food web. Scientists see weaker winds at the equator. The surface winds, which normally blow east to west along the equator, instead they weaken or in some cases start blowing the other direction. This results in less cold water rising up near the coastline. Typically, El Nino events persist for six to 18 months. Take a look at the wintertime ocean temperatures off the west coast during the strong El Ninos of 1997 and 2015. In 1997, warming was strongest near the coast. In 2015, warming was more uniform and widespread. Let's take a deeper dive into ocean conditions. Four years ago, El Nino exerted powerful effects around the globe, eroding California beaches, driving drought in Northern South America, Africa, and Asia, and bringing record rains to the Pacific Northwest and Southern um, South America. During this time, the California current was already disrupted due to an unusual pattern of warming, popularly known as the blob. Our scientists gave this name, the blob, to simply describe an unusually warm area of ocean temperatures. The blob and El Nino together changed ocean food for salmon, with the blob driving most of that change. The two of them together had negative impacts on food for salmon. What's the opposite of El Nino? La Nina. Let's take a closer look. On September 10th, our Climate Prediction Center declared La Nina conditions. One sign of La Nina is cooler than average surface waters in the central and eastern Pacific area shown in the blue areas near the equator. La Nina, the flip side of El Nino, is the periodic cooling of the central Pacific Ocean that affects weather patterns around the globe. The surface winds across the entire tropical Pacific are stronger than usual, and most of the tropical Pacific Ocean is cooler than average. Rainfall even increases over Indonesia. Overall, our scientists see the following trends during La Nina. Stronger winds along the equator, an increase in rainfall over Indonesia, and more ingredients to help the ocean food web. 
let's shift to ocean food and see where salmon fit in the ocean food web. Salmon feed on fish, squid, eels, and shrimp. Remember our small but mighty pink salmon? The tiny marine crustaceans that pink salmon eat are what give it its flesh its pink color. Interactions with predators, animals that eat salmon, and prey, animals that salmon eat, are factors that contribute to a safe and healthy ocean adventure for salmon. In a system as large as the Pacific Ocean, available prey varies among seasons and space, locations, and across years. And this can have direct effects on salmon growth and survival. If the ocean water is too warm, then there's less high quality food for salmon. So they have to work even harder to find enough food. Pink and coho salmon spend about 18 months at sea. Sockeye typically spend two years. Chum, typically four years, and Chinook can spend up to eight years before journeying back to their hometown rivers. Many West Coast salmon migrate far into the Pacific before returning to West Coast rivers. Several salmon overlap with killer whales as they return to the Northwest. So this picture shows our best guess on the migration paths of adult salmon, depending on which river they came from. Chinook may travel as far as 2,500 miles from their hometown river. Pink salmon, on the other hand, don't travel quite as far from their hometown river. Chinook salmon don't seem to deviate from their feeding routes. Our scientists find that even when ocean conditions are extremely poor due to El Nino or other climate events, Chinook salmon still go to the same eating places. Let's take a look at more tools scientists use to track and study salmon in the ocean. We have bright orange drone boats called sail drones. Fish surveys along the West Coast provide an essential view into fish populations and help set fishing rules. Sail drones improve how fast and how well we conduct these surveys. A second type of equipment is called a wave glider. They are wave propelled solar powered surfboards connected to an underwater glider that controls speed and direction. They measure waves, currents, ocean temperature, salinity, and surface weather. We also need ships to do our work. Researchers drop anchors into the Pacific Ocean as part of their salmon research. The anchor is attached to a receiver that detects salmon movements in the ocean. So how many salmon return to their hometown river? Well, every river is different and every salmon is different, but for today, let's focus on the Klamath River watershed in Northern California. This watershed is made up of many rivers, streams, and creeks. Let's talk about one of these rivers in this watershed, the Shasta River. This river sees a wide range of adult Chinook salmon coming back every year. Historically, over 80,000 Chinook salmon returned annually to the Shasta River. This is a graph scientists use to report adult returns. Along the horizontal axis or the x-axis, you will see different years. And along the vertical axis or the y-axis, you will see the number or the counts of adults. Today, the number of Chinook that returned to the river is much lower than 80,000. Take a look at the blue line. The current average number of adult returns is about 6,708 Chinook. Let's focus on two years where we blew past the current average. I highlighted two years in red. In 2012, we saw almost 30,000 Chinook return. And in 2018, we saw just over 20,000 Chinook come back. Scientists work really hard to explain these trends in adult returns, but it can be very challenging to nail down just one reason why we see different number of adult returns every year. We generally like to see higher numbers rather than lower numbers, but we do know ocean conditions play a major part in how many adults will return back to the river. 
that officially closes the loop in the salmon life cycle. Now, if you're curious about how salmon taste, then there is a responsible way to support your local fishing community. Commer commercial fishing companies help keep our grocery stores full of fresh wild caught fish options. I want to encourage everyone to visit their local market or grocery store and explore the salmon options. Read the labels carefully and if possible, select the wild caught option for the, for the highest nutrient benefits. Now that some of us are cooking more of our meals in our own kitchen, remember to visit our Fish Watch website to find fish recipes. And lastly, make sure you, your parents, your teachers look up our amazing resources. There is still so much more to learn about salmon, the ocean, the rivers, and our coastal communities. So keep reading, keep learning, and ask questions about the environment around you. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Oh. So a total coincidence because, you know, most days I have no idea what day it is, but we actually had salmon for dinner last night. We picked up some, <laughs> um, some salmon belly at, the far at our farmer's market last weekend <laughs> and cooked it up last night. It was delicious. Awesome. <laughs> I'm lucky. I have, I have a, a young child that actually enjoys salmon. So I'm very lucky on that. Yeah. All right. Well, we've had a whole bunch of questions come in while you were talking. So um, I am going to jump right to them. Um, do you mentioned a lot of the predators of salmon? Um, and we saw the picture of like the, the seal with the half eaten salmon in your in your show. Do do dolphins also eat salmon? Dolphins may, but they aren't a major predator, a known predator where we, we can actually, I mean, the pictures we do get, we do get mostly focus on killer whales and seals. Right. Um, but to my knowledge, dolphins, it's not a major component of their diet. Okay. Um, so if they come across one or they might try it out, but it's not what they're mostly, they're not a yeah. major predator and it's not a big part of their diet. Right, right. Now things could shift in their food web where maybe it's the last option. And um, that's, we certainly see that sometimes with species shifting their food preferences because of availability. Um, we have a, another question. The, the fish that stay in the ocean longer, do they, I don't know if you know this, because like you said, it is hard to find out, but do they intermingle with the fish that are heading back to the river or um, are they in different parts of the, the, the coastal waters? So when they stay out for longer, they, again, we have an idea of their migration route. Mm -hmm. So we know that they're somewhere in that route. And if they'll stay, we, we think they'll stay in the group if, from the same river, right? So they'll, they'll be on their particular path. Um, and they, they just stay out there longer. Whereas another migration route, like the pinks, would look a little different because they're coming back uh, on average sooner than maybe a Chinook would. Okay. So some of the, the salmon, the different species of salmon also stay out different lengths of time? Exactly, exactly. So what we see is Chinook stay out perhaps the longest, you know, up to eight years. Now some can come back two, four, eight, but on average, Chinook are out there for quite a while uh, relative to the pink salmon um and uh, you know quite uh, not as long yeah okay um oh so many questions I'm read through these right here um so the we know and so in california we've talked about and we saw from the graphs that you have that the the chinook salmon population isn't as as healthy as it used to be the, the numbers are declining is that true of salmon all over the world or just those in california um so i would say it, there's a there it's it's a trend for west coast salmon what wild salmon um uh, all over the world, I, I don't know, I'm not familiar with the populations like in South America um, or even down in New Zealand, but for West Coast 
uh, salmon, we're seeing declines in our wild populations. And so that's why you will see some uh, listed as endangered, as threatened. And so those are, those, those are given special protection under the Endangered Species Act. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we do that because their numbers have become so low uh, that we are working to recover and get uh, population abundance up. Okay. Right. Are there any um, particular salmon runs or salmon populations that are um, the most healthy? Um, so the most healthy ones um, are probably, I, I guess, de definition of healthy. Some of these, some of these salmon runs are um, a mix of wild salmon, but also salmon that were born in a hatchery. Um, so that um, hatchery element kind of boosts, boosts the number of the, the salmon that return. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as wild salmon, the healthiest populations, even though we're starting to see decline everywhere, is probably the most Northwest populations in Alaska mm -hmm. um, and Washington and Oregon. So unfortunately, the California stocks, the California um, salmon are getting hit the hardest right now, but scientists are starting to see even evidence of, of healthiness drop in Alaska and Washington. And there's, there's salmon runs in the Western Pacific as well, right? In Russia and the Kamchatka area? Is right, that right. So they, they have, they have migration routes, like I showed that would kind of be more on that side of the ocean. They, mm -hmm. they wouldn't probably, those migration routes wouldn't come as far over here, just as our salmon migration routes don't come down to Southern California. Right. You know, they, they are, they're all traveling North to the cold water. So, mm -hmm. so we're all mainly headed to the Northwest and, and benefiting from the very cold nutrient filled uh, ocean water. Okay. All right. Um, is there any nutritional difference between farm raised or wild caught salmon? Yes, <laughs> yes <laughs> there is. Um, and that was, that was my plug to try to promote wild caught. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen that the, the um, omega um, oils and the fat, the, just the nutrients in wild caught option is going to have the best benefits for your health. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, the, the big hurdle on a wild caught option is that it is, it is noticeably more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so, so most people will often um, only be able to do, you know, farm, farm raised option. And um, we just like to promote when you can um, to to select a wild caught option um, because that's that fish um, has hasn't been exposed to some of the same conditions that a farm raised salmon would be exposed to. Mainly, it's it's been in its natural environment. It's it's gone through the life cycle in a natural way. Um, with as little chemicals or um, side effects, <laughs> you know, as possible. And so that, that's why we promote wild caught, but we realize um, there is a price difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we actually have a question about what makes the salmon reddish pink. It's different for the two, right? Uh, for the two. For the, for the farm raised versus the wild caught. Yeah, so so when you um, compare the two meat colors, you know a wild caught will uh, uh, perhaps as a farm raised will be more orange and have more fatty fattiness to it, whereas a wild caught option should be more um, kind of a red. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of on the red, dark, dark orange, red, mm -hmm. um, and so so the difference in that is again what they're feeding the salmon. You know, while they're raising them at the farm, um, it's just it's just not like the, the the natural setting. So, you know, all all of what they're exposed to at the farm, the the water quality, the the food, the resources um, in order for them to grow affects their their meat and the color of their meat um but again it's it's um just when possible when you're able to um invest in the wild caught option 
uh, we encourage folks to do that. What is it specifically in the ocean that gives them that red color? Is so for pink, mm -hmm. yeah, for pink salmon, they you they eat the tiny crustaceans, you mm -hmm. know, um, uh, the zooplankton, and so that helps with the pink color. Um, for the other, um, I assume um, that goes for the other species as well. Mm -hmm. um, it mainly coming um, from chemicals and what they're absorbing from their prey, mm -hmm. um, giving them that that kind of orange reddish color. So it's, the little, it's the tiny crustaceans that they're eating. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we're almost out of time. Um, there's a lot more questions. Do you think you can stay for a couple extra minutes? Sure. sure. Okay. So viewers at home, if, if you are able to stay, we're going to just ask a few more questions because we've got a lot coming in today. Um, I know that um, you work on steelhead also, correct? Yes. Do you, do you have similar data on steelhead migration? <laughs> uh, we have probably even less. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, so yeah, there's a reason I did not say the word steelhead in this, Got in it. this, um, but, but it's a great question because um, most of uh, the steelhead populations in California are listed mm -hmm. as either threatened or endangered. Um, so uh, it becomes even more challenging to track those individuals. Mm -hmm. um, it, they're, there are special permits needed to handle uh, fish that are listed under the Endangered Species Act. So it, it, it becomes just um, more interesting when we're, you're wanting to study a fish that's endangered. And most, most of the steelhead um, runs are endangered in California, or threatened or endangered in, in California. Certainly the ones in Southern California. <laughs> right, and steelhead go further south in California than the salmon do, right? Cor cor Correct. Yeah. So um, steelhead, uh, we're at the southern extent of their geographic range here in Southern California. So the Southern California steelhead is is really on the edge of their geographic um, temperate range in terms of the water temperature they can withstand. Mm -hmm. uh, so so um, salmon do not come as far down. So so um, Central Valley is about is about as far down as they would come versus obviously steelhead, which we have here in Southern California. Okay. Um, speaking of the tag studies, are these based on wild populations, hatchery raised or both? I mean, it seems like it'd be easier to tag the hatchery ones before they go out, but are you able to work with, with wild salmon? Yeah, so um, it's both. It's both. Um, some of these research studies can um, uh, tag, they, they can get a hold of tagging wild, wild caught salmon, and then some are um, uh, from the hatcheries. So it gets, it gets complicated, right? When we're trying to study what the wild population does versus what the hatchery population does. And there's behavioral differences, mm -hmm. um, there, there really are. But um, in general, we're, we're just trying to get an idea of where they go once they're, once they're in the ocean, who eats them, how long they survive um, and things like that. And so that's, that's why it's still a bit of a mystery um, given that we do have this mix of hatcheries, wild caught, um, dynamics in, in almost every, every watershed. Okay. Um, so we, we did hear from previous speakers that, um, you know, climate change is impacting salmon in the rivers. For example, the, the rising temperatures, the warmer water makes it harder for the, the eggs to hatch. Um, are the rising temperatures of the ocean waters having an impact on salmon as well? You, you mentioned that cold water tends to be more, more nutrient rich. Yeah, yeah. So what we're seeing, so back in 2016, we really saw the connection between uh, poor ocean conditions and salmon returns. So, you know, when, so scientists, climate scientists, oceanographers, you know, when they see that there are poor ocean conditions, warm waters, the blob, El Nino, um, we, we do not see a healthy high number of adult returns. Um, and so that, that connection in terms of climate change is that we're, we're really, we're really watching how that, how that's changing, how much the war, how much the warm temperatures are changing, how quickly and how long they're staying around. 
um, how long that condition is persisting in the ocean conditions. So um, again, the, the conditions in the ocean are really a great predictor, um, among other factors, if you can successfully exit from your watershed. Um, among other factors, ocean condition is a really major critical indicator of you know, the predictions in terms of adult returns. All right, well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm seeing people are having to leave, you know, leaving from their, their late lunch break or however they were able to join us. But I just want to say thank you so much, um, Brittany, for joining us. And thank you to everybody who joined us from home. For more information on water in California, you can always visit our webpage, water.ca.gov, or order materials from our education page, water.ca.gov backslash education dash materials. Uh, NOAA Fisheries has additional resources that you can get from them. Brittany shared a number of those earlier. Um, you can also visit their, their main West Coast webpage, fisheries.noaa.gov backslash region backslash West Coast. And all of these will be available as hyperlinks in our, um, on our YouTube page. And they also have resources on salmon education. Um, so in addition to these online resources, um, when things return to normal, when we can go back and visit our local aquariums, I really encourage you to do so. I know there are multiple aquariums in California that have exhibits and educational programs on salmon because they are so important. They are that connection between the white water and the blue water. Um, and one other thing that you can do to help salmon this month the California Coastal Cleanup is on through the end of September. And this is an excellent opportunity for a outside socially distance activity that can really help your local communities as well as the salmon. And you don't have to live by the coast to participate. You don't have to travel to the coast to participate because just like salmon, waste often travels down our rivers to the sea. So um, we can all go out and participate in the coastal cleanup and you can even download an app um, from this website on the Ocean Conservancy page. You can link to it. It's called Clean Swell, and it's available for both Android and Apple devices. You can document the trash you pick up. And last I heard, as of last week, California was leading the world on the amount of trash collected. Um, so let's go out there and clean up our coasts. We will be back next Wednesday at 1 p.m. with a new series, and this one's going to be looking at the role and the history of flooding in California, how science and engineering are working to reduce our flood risk while also maintaining the benefits that floodwaters bring, um, like those we heard about two weeks ago for juvenile salmon on our floodplains. And we'll be wrapping that up during Flood Preparedness Week with a program on what we as individuals can do to be flood ready in our homes. So we really hope you can join us. Thank you again, Brittany. Thank you, everybody else. Have a great week. We hope to see you back here next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.